Thank you for the invitation to speak today. I've been looking forward to that. I'm today speaking about the Palmyra portrait project for very obvious reasons, namely because the Carlsberg Foundation since 2012 have been funding this project and um, in November decided to fund it for another four years, not on the basis of us not having done what we promised, but exactly because we did what we promised and collected until now more than 2,800 Palmarine funerary portraits. Um, published them in more than 50 publications within the last four years. And then, of course, also in combination with the situation in Syria, um, as you know, Palmyra is situated in Syria, um, it has now turned out that the material that we are sitting on as the corpus really has implications for cultural heritage strategies, um, both in the Middle East and um, beyond. And it's, of course, a pleasure for us in the project to be able to continue the work which we've done um, the last four years. You're probably all painstakingly aware of where Palmyra is situated now, namely in the Syrian desert between the Mediterranean and the Euphrates River. It was, so to say, what we might call the last stop on the Silk Road. Um, trading came through the city, caravans, the, the camel caravans ended in Palmyra. Um, all the goods were reloaded on donkey caravans and taken to the Mediterranean coast and the other way around. It was also, or is to a certain extent still, a very rich archaeological site. We have um, a lot of inscriptions from this maybe only the, the, the only true bilingual city of this region also, which Palmyra was. Greek was used very much in the public sphere, along with the Palmyrene local Aramaic dialect. But in the funerary sphere, which we in the Palmyra Portrait Project um, deal with exclusively, the local Aramaic um, dialect was used. Also showing something about how people would represent themselves and use various means in various spheres. So the idea to the project basically came from the wonderful collection in the New Carlsberg Glyptothek, and we are very happy that we have such a good collaboration with the museum also and can basically have access to the collection um, whenever we need to see things. Um, so that's basically what formed the idea of the project, because the collection at the New Carlsberg Glyptothek is now we can say for sure the largest collection in the world of these portraits outside of Syria itself, followed closely by the National Museum in Istanbul and um, the Louvre in, in Paris. And I'll talk a little bit about the historiography of this collection also later. The second component was that we already then knew that this was the largest corpus of representations of individuals from the Roman period outside of Rome itself, which in itself makes this material extremely significant when you study identities in Rome and uh, the regions around Rome and the representation of individuals in various regions. Furthermore, um, we um, have the very famous Danish archaeologist Harald Ingholt, who not only was an archaeologist but a theologian and a Semitic philologist and had a splendid career uh, both in Aarhus and Copenhagen and um, ended his career in Yale as professor of Semitic studies. He, um, in 1928, published his habilitation, Studia over Palmyrene Skulptur, where he basically laid the grounds for the chronology of these portraits on the basis of the uh, among other things, the New Carlsberg um, Glyptothek's collection. And this is still really remains a standard work on Palmarine um, sculpture, and this is another reason that we thought that this research should be pushed forward within the borders um, of Denmark as well. And I here have a por portrait photo of Ingholt uh, among some of the sculptures, and I think it might be a little bit like dogs and their owners, and um, there is a certain similarity between Ingholt and the Palmarine um, funerary portraits as well, which he spent so much time on. These portraits were put up in graves. They were basically um, especially made to be put up in the Palmarine Tower and underground graves to 
close off grave niches within which mummified bodies were laid. So they were part of huge family galleries, so to say, not only close family, but extended families and um, held burials over generations. Some of them held up to 400 burials, so we're very um, large grave complexes. You here see to, to the left a plan of an underground um, a grave, a hypogea, and you see one of the tower graves um, to the right, and they could have un up to five stories, were not extended over time, but the hypogea were extended over time, so you could so to say expand over generations. And what we get out of this are these huge family galleries, so to say. And that's basically what we can also now, through the project Corpus, look into gene genealogies of families over generations and how, um, uh, how these uh, developed. So it is the lar largest um, corpus of funerary portraits from the Roman period outside of Rome. Um, we have now collected more than 2,800, which is far beyond what any scholar expected would exist. The estimate was until then 1,500. They have a very tight chronological framework, came into existence in the late first century BCE and went out of production when Palmyra was sacked by the Romans in 272 AD. And now we can also say that around 3% of them are precisely dated through inscriptions, so actually have dates saying in which year the person died. Um, that changes the picture quite a bit, because until now, researchers have also estimated that more than 10% were actually precisely dated, so this has gone down um, immensely after um, we have the corpus. And then, of course, again, that Newcastle Glyptothek holds the largest collections, does that we can actually do a lot of anamnesis on these. We have a long tradition in Denmark for um, archaeology in uh, the Middle East, not least because the Carlsberg Foundation has been a great supporter of this work um, for more than a century also. The first catalogue of parts of the Palmyra collection was done by the rabbi David Simonsen in, nine, in 1889, Skulptur og Inskrifter fra Palmyra i Nykarlsberg Glyptothek, and it was also on the basis of this collection that Ingholdt did his work. It's interestingly the brewer himself who was very involved in choosing large parts of this collection alongside with collect collecting his Greek and Roman sculpture, which you know were actually put up in, in this villa in, uh, in the first instance before the collections became basically too big to be housed here. So on this point also he was visionary as well because he was collecting what was then considered to be provincial art, art from outside of Rome, outside of the core regions of Greece, and but actually decided to include these into his collections. And the Nukatsberg Lübdothek has 128 of these portraits. But it started before um, Ingholdt, um, Johannes Elit Östrup, traveled through uh, the Middle East on horseback from Egypt all the way to Copenhagen. And more interestingly, it was the Carlsberg Foundation who actually funded this trip and bought the horse for him. So I'm, I'm not sure that we, we, can, we can get the Carlsberg Foundation to, to fund these sorts of, of uh, caravans through the Middle East anymore, but they funded Johannes Östrup because they thought mapping out parts of the Syrian desert would be a very um, big contribution by Danish researchers to this region of the world. It, of course, went with a trend of the cultural tours of gentlemen from a certain level in society. He was not the only one who rode alone through, uh, through the desert at this point in time. And he also initiated the extension of the Palmyra collection through his very close contact to the Danish consul Lloydville in Beirut. We can now, through his publications, actually say that one of the most famous graves that he supposedly identified, namely the, th uh, um, um, the tomb of the 
three brothers, was actually not that tomb, and these are results that we'll be presenting in, in Paris next week, because through the archives and through his published articles, we can see that, he was, uh, that what people have thought was this very famous tomb actually was another very large tomb, and we have done, we, we could do this through the combination of the wall paintings and the architecture of, um, of the grave. So this is just one way of showing how this archival research also adds to what we know about Palmyra. Also today now, when we absolutely have no uh, possibility of visiting the site. But Harald Ingholdt, he took up the work of Simonsen and Östrup and wrote his habilitation, as I said, um, published in 1928, Studia over Palmyrin Skulptur. Alongside this, he also conducted very intense field work in Palmyra in the 1920s and um, 1930s. Um, he had three, uh, cam three large campaigns and one smaller campaign in 1937. And we only know this because his family has recently contacted me because we published a book on him and his daughter, who's now 88 years, could tell me that she joined him in the 1937 campaign to Palmyra because it doesn't say anywhere whether it was 35, 36 or 37. So now we have a fixed point for that as well. And actually the family has very wonderful movies from the excavations that he undertook then. So um, these we are going to put online in the project as well. But not only was he active in Palmyra, he also excavated in Hammer, also funded by the New Karlsberg, um, group, uh, or the Karlsberg Foundation. And of course, he also went on tours with all the other famous archeologists of the time. Like um, you see in the slide uh, up to the right, he's visiting Dura Europas with some of the most renowned scholars of the time, Rostovsev, uh, Comte de uh, Mesnil de Brosson, and, and other of the big personalities of, of the time. In the slide, um, uh, in the right left corner, you see him during one of his excavation of the famous grave of Malku, whereof the Glyptothek also has some of the pieces. After, um, after he had gone to Yale, he continued building up his very large archive, which is also based at the New Karlsberg Glyptothek, and which comprises more of 800 portraits, and basically was the basis of his habilitation, but he continued um, the building up of this archive after he went to Yale oh, as well, amazing. and then decided that the New Karlsberg Glyptothek should have it back, actually, before he died, and parts, very large parts of it were sent Back to the New Karlsberg Glyptothek. Gunhild Plow, who had been working on a lot of the material in the 80s and 90s, managed to both bring out a new catalogue together with Finn Uwe Wilbert Hansen and also to do a very nice substantial catalogue on the collection um, which came out in the 90s as well. But she never managed to um, write the big book that she had wanted to um, also based on the um, Palmyra collection in the New Karlsberg Glyptothek. What we were lucky to found, find when we also looked into the archives um, was actually Anna Marie, who told us, well, on the shelf next to the archive, more or less, Harald Ingholz's diaries, um, excavation diaries, were still uh, lying around. So uh, we were allowed to take them back to Aarhus. And what we did with both the archive, while we had it in Aarhus, and the diaries, which we still have in Aarhus, uh, was to digitize them. Um, and then on the basis of our large da database, concord every page of the thousand pages uh, archive with the pieces in the database. On top of that, to connect the relevant pages of the diary with the pieces that are in collections across the world. And very interesting results are still coming out of this. We are not completely finished with that yet. But for example, we now have very nice pages with Ingholz drawings showing the original colors of sarcophagi, uh, which are um, still in Syria, partly in the National Museum in Damascus, but also of pieces which um, Ingholt actually managed to make the Rask Örstel Foundation pay and bring back to the New Karlsberg Glyptothek. 
So many museums and collections around the world have these funerary portraits in, in their collections. Actually, any museum with respect for itself will have a couple, and you'll be surprised. I mean, you go around, and in the most unexpected pla places, one or two of these pop up. And there are, of course, also a lot of private collections which we've been um, in, in touch with and collected material from. We were even so lucky that um, the German Archaeological Institute, um, who also um, uh, had um, an institute in Damascus, had been conducting a documentation project in the National Museum. And when they heard about our project, they actually gave us all their material. And uh, one of the slides here is from the storerooms in the National Museum of Damascus. And there you also sort of see what the challenges are when you work with completely unpublished material and have to integrate it in, in some kind of publishable way. So some have a few. Middelhaus Museum in Stockholm, which I visited a couple of weeks ago, until then had two. We now discovered a third one. So there are always also something lying around in the corners. And then we have the three very large collections in Europe, namely New Carlsberg Glyptothek, the Istanbul National Museum, and Louvre in Paris, Paris. And all the larger collections that means to us all collections above 10 pieces we have um, visited and we have made a primary, primary examination of these pieces and can now also say in particular a lot more about the ancient coloring of, of these things which seem to be so white but in the case of the Louvre it was because in the 80s it was obviously very common to, to sort of um, um, give these uh, uh, quite a tough wash with a little bit of, of uh, water and sand to make them even whiter than they seemed. So there are some of these collections also where we don't have that much color trace anymore. The New Carlsberg Glyptothek, we are very lucky to uh, actually have quite a few color traces. So it's on the basis of all this material, archival material, diary material, that um, we initiated the Palmyra Portrait Project in 2012. Research until then had really focused on how provincial this art was, how out of its time and how it could be um, compared with uh, provincial trades sort of going on in, in um, various regions of, of modern Turkey, in Hierapolis, in the Decapolis region. And we thought that through actually collecting this large corpus, we might actually be able to turn around the trend in research and say something about the non-provinciality of these portraits, situating them within their local situation. And I think we managed quite well until now. So what we do is um, we we give each portrait um, a very extensive entry uh, in our database, which also makes it extremely well searchable. And we have very good people working with us who are very good at keep making sure that everybody uses the same terminology and these sorts of things. So across these more than 2,800 pieces, we can actually now make very good statistics and interesting results are coming out of this. Of course, many of these were still in situ in the graves in Palmyra, or they were in collections in Syria um, as well. And um, now we, of course, have some, uh, some problems with that since we cannot get to the things. Overall, one can say that the portraiture can be grouped into various constellations. We have the single portraits, which are by far the most. We have the double or several portraits depicting the deceased and family members. Or we have banqueting scenes, both on reliefs and sarcophagi. And I've just shown you a few examples here. The three with the blue background are from the New Carlsberg Glyptothek collection, because one also has to say again there, when the collection was initiated, Emphasis was not put on the most beautiful pieces, but on the variation within the group. So it is really a front-runner collection. They came into being in the late 1st century BCE, and their shapes are really more than being busts, although everybody in research until now have called them busts. But they are basically depictions of people down until the navel, so much more than what we normally imagine um, a bust being, which also gave the possibility on these items to really show a, la a long row of other items which would not have been possible in a normal portrait bust. So the textiles, many attributes, that they could be holding in their hands, or the gestures that they make in these, um, in these um, portraits. 
And here, just to show you another slide um, from inside um, some of the tombs, where you can see the niches in which they were basically put up, or see the niches where they have been taken down. Some of these, um, but by far less than we thought, follow, of course, Roman imperial trends, especially in the second century um, AD, where uh, the, the very bearded emperors uh, begin to come into fashion. And that, of course, also has an influence on this, um, on this portraiture. Or, as uh, is the case with one of the pieces, again, from New Carlsberg Lyptothek, which Inghold actually also um, brought back to the collection, uh, where the woman is wearing a very nice Roman-influenced hairstyle. But by far, follow, far the most, follow a very distinct local palmarine style that cannot be said to imitate Roman portraiture um, at all, but really been uniquely adapted to the local needs. Because these grave forms in Palmyra came into being exactly at the beginning of the first century AD, and this was where the portraiture basically also was introduced in this way into, into Palmarine society. The very interesting thing is that some of these carried inscription telling us that they are the souls of people, not only the expressions, but the nifish, which is a, a, a local word for soul, and some of the tombs are in themselves even labeled as being souls of people the family. So we have a very, again, um, local tradition which is being developed at this uh, point in time. So um, through the historiographic research we've been able to conduct also, we can in some uh, cases actually trace the biography of the objects through the archive, because Inghold would, before he bought pieces, actually uh, photograph them, in this case in Beirut, before he decided whether he wanted to buy them and take them uh, home to Denmark from Beirut. And in some of the cases, like in the case of the beauty of Palmyra, we've even been able to contextualize the grave in which he excavated this portrait, brought it to Beirut, and had the Rask Ørsted Foundation buy it and bring it back to Denmark. And that was in, um, well, here you see the piece, the, the very, well, the most famous piece from the Palmyra collection, The Beauty of Palmyra, which was published in Berlingske Tidene in 1929, the year after it had been excavated, brought to Denmark and put on display in December 1929. So, um, because he was at Yale, um, I at some point went to Yale to have a th look through the archives there, and it turned out that exactly that file, the Kassar Abjad file, had been left in the Yale archives. And there, all of Ingholz's notes, including all his excavation photos of this excavation that he conducted in this family tomb, as it was, was there together with photos of the pieces also. So in that way, we have been able to do sort of historiographic um, excavations and contextualize one of these most famous pieces back into its original context. Furthermore, we've also been able for the first time to contextualize some of the very famous um, wall paintings from the graves in Palmyra, which, until, which are published, but not published in context. But these were graves that Inghold visited or excavated himself. And they were then published by him also, but without the grave context, because he wanted to do that later at some point. But now through his diaries, we can actually, and the very nice sketches that he did, we can contextualize these. And this is one of the things that we are also presenting at the Paris conference um, next week. Of course, now we have some completely new challenges uh, because of the civil war. In, in Syria and also because of the exploding falsification industry. Um, furthermore, we are now together with uh, UNESCO and some other organizations conducting research on, among other things, satellite images. And I just show you one example here. Um, these are satellite images that you see um, well, on, in the top row. Um, to uh, the left, you, you see the, the supposed um, grave tower of Ilabel. And um, to the right, you see that it's been visibly damaged. But when you actually compare these things with monuments on the ground, and the slide to the left in the lower row is the tomb of Ilabel, um, and compare it with the satellite image, you actually see that it is not the monument 
itself. It is not the Tower of Illabil which has been destroyed. It's another grave tower. And this really, at, at this point in time, helps to nuance the situation and the information that we are getting out of Syria, which partly also is shaped by the Syrian government and put on international web pages, and which UNESCO actually, without checking, just takes over and puts on their web page. And that's why we've now entered a collaboration with them, where we look through this, <laughs> these things before it's actually posted. Um, because that is um, a big problem, both when monuments that are not destroyed are put on the internet as being destroyed, or the other way around. And of course, for the graves that have been destroyed and had in C2 things, we now in the project has, have the best contextualized material and researchers can come to us and use the database. Also in connection with the looting of tombs, um, we are sometimes able to help. Um, Artaban's tomb was looted in 2014. Uh, 22 portraits were reported stolen, but actually the tomb has 26 portraits, so what happened to the last four? Um, and in that connection, we come to my last point, because what we've been doing already since 2011, from before we started the, the project with funding, is to actually monitor as good as we can the art market. And there's the uh, legal art market, of course, and we can count around 50 portraits that until now have been sold on, um, on the art market. And this decreased dramatically as, as the large auction houses found out that, that this was simply a no-go and, um, and people had too much attention on it. Um, but, but still, we put these in our database and hopefully in some uh, cases we can be able to also help with retrieving some of these. But even in 2015, Christie's sold um, a Palmarine sculpture um, saying that it came from an American private collection. However, there is absolutely no record of this American private collection, neither in our extensive database nor in other places. And th these are the cases where we can now also work together with, in particular, a very active state attorney in, in New York who really deals with, um, with the art market on the American uh, side. But even on eBay, you can buy these things if you are uh, lucky. And um, they are um, sold with faked provenance papers, of course. I mean, of course, it says that it's completely clean pieces. But when you compare objects with provenance papers, it turns out that the provenance papers actually are talking about completely other objects than the one that's being sold. But this was sold in 2015 on eBay. Last but not least, um, very interestingly and very sad, there's a huge local falsification industry. These you can buy also on eBay, but collectors buy them through um, various channels as well. And um, one of the side <laughs> effects of the Palmyra Portrait Project is that many of these agents of these collectors actually contact us. Um, would like to invite us on nice trips to authentify their, <laughs> their falsified collections. Uh, we say no, we don't do those things. But what, of course, is interesting is that it's giving us some insight into this falsification economy that goes along the illicit trade of these objects. And that is really exploding. Um, and what I just want to say last but least are really that all these individual uh, people um, all these uh, people of Palmyra who are um, shown in these portraits, um, Ingholt and Östrup and the Brewer, are really connected through one aspect, and that is really through the visionary um, style of the Carlsberg Foundation, who dares to actually support completely basic humanistic research, which at the point in time when we started the project, we of course had no idea what sort of impact it would have. Other places would have said, this is a boring corpus, pro uh, <laughs> corpus project and it won't bring anything to society. But I think we have shown that very basic research might have extreme implications, uh, both on our way of seeing the world, but also quite literary in a situation as the one we are experiencing with Syria now. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Rubina.
Does it work? Yes. Yes. For this, um, this uh, uh, report on the fortunately very, very numerous palmarine, pal palmarine portraits, and may I add that we at the Glyptotech are very, very, very grateful that Rubina and her, <coughs> and, <coughs> and her team are coming. And I may add also that we have had all our portraits scanned by a team from Japan. So uh, I think that, uh, uh, that uh, 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 our portraits are not uh, only the most numerous, they are also, also <laughs> one of the mo most studied collections yeah. in the world. And that's a very, uh, that's a very, very good thing. Are there questions for Rubina? Yes. And uh, the microphone, please. Hello. Yeah. Thank you very much, Rubina, for a nice uh, presentation. Um, I have a short question. Uh, Palmara is said to be a multicultural city. Uh, but within the, the portraits, are you able to identify these uh, diversities in ethnicity? And can you actually make a composition of how the, the city was, uh, was com well, constructed or et in, in ethnicity? Thank As you. I very briefly mentioned, it is, I mean, to a large extent, a bilingual city. I mean, really with Greek and local Palmarine Aramaic, but only in the public sphere. I mean, in the, in the funerary sphere, which might not have been completely private. I mean, if you think about these graves with up to 400 people in them, there must have been some sort of traffic. Um, but no, that is basically exclusively Palmarine Aramaic, apart from a few instances where Greek is used, but some of these instances are then non-Palmarines non who were um, buried in Palmyra. For example, a Roman, um, a Roman military man from Beirut is one of the examples of a, of a Greek inscription, but by far the most are, are kept in the local dialect. So, so this diversity is, is difficult to see in the funerary sphere, but not in the public sphere. There it's completely obvious. Yeah. Lisa? Um, thank you. Uh, you uh, spoke of the beginning, uh, the start of the Palmarine portraits in the first century BC as <coughs> something independent, something unique, not connected, as I agree, to the Roman tradition. But uh, what about the Hellenistic uh, tradition from all over the Near yeah. East? I mean, we are in an area that had had uh, such portraits uh, for centuries by now. So uh, what would you think of that? I think uh, you showed a lady, yeah. which I, I would tend to think she looked rather Hellenistic, even if the style is very characteristically Palmarine. Yeah, I mean, as you know, we, we have a huge problem with Hellenistic Palmyra. I mean, the, the, the newest publications with Hellenistic in the title are basically only Roman things published. Um, so, so there is this sort of gap as we experience many places in the Near East. Um, but I actually cut, had to cut the Hellenistic part of my talk out because I didn't have so much time. But we actually have forerunners because of course we have the full figure under life-size stelae which stand in a very Hellenistic um, uh, portrait tradition. There are a few of those, that's correct, and they stand in this basically Hellenistic tradition, which also comes from the Phoenician coast, or which we know very well um, from the cities um, along the Phoenician coast. Um, but but uh, since these grave um, monuments came into being exactly in the first century uh, AD, um, we can say that the material from these only stem from this very tight period of time. But there are these few examples which have, which have been standing on single graves, of course, and of course, also in that way, might have gotten lost over the centuries. Yeah. There's another question here. Yes, just a short one. Uh, Ubina, do you think that uh, archaeologists could be considered kind of ambassadors uh, on behalf of their countries and even behalf of uh, the, the international community? And uh, I, in that case, uh, what is your uh, experience so far 
uh, in the case of Palmyra uh, and uh, what uh, could be the main challenges we have ahead of us? Well, what I experienced, I mean, in December, the Nordisk Ministerråd um, had a conference in Oslo where um, researchers were invited to, to speak, and I was invited to speak about the Palmarine uh, portraits. And I experienced an openness from the, the political side of things and also from the various police and custom forces in actually understanding what it is that we can contribute with. And of course, this is uh, the Palmyra Portrait Project is quite basic and they really understood, oh, so we can actually check some of these pieces. <laughs> so we can, so, oh, th that's what you can do for us. So I think in the first instance, and now they're talking about making an, a national force on an, a strategy force. I think this is always the way things start. And that is, of course, where researchers come into, um, come into the picture, if we can formulate what it is that we can add um, to, to the picture. Um, and right now, of course, with the situation in Syria, it, there's a lot, I, I think there's more than 65 NGOs working on documentation uh, projects. But one really needs to discuss what makes sense in the case when things have already been destroyed or where things are being looted that were not documented before. I mean, where is it that we actually need to focus our energy? And these sorts of discussions, I think, uh, archaeologists can be part of in a, um, in a constructive way.